Okay, this is chapter two of The Remnant. The sun was hanging far out across the sea when the dense forest which covered Mount Carmel abruptly ended, and they found themselves in the temple clearing. Judith gasped and stared in speechless wonder. Phineas had described the temple and the school and the life of the priests and the monks who lived there, the scribes who copied the sacred scriptures and the library which held the precious scrolls, but no words could describe the beauty and peace and holiness that assailed Judith's senses and made her tremble as did her first sight of the place where she would spend her life. From the time she had first learned to talk, she had begged Phineas and El Katma to tell her about this hidden sacred place and the ancient prophets who had lived in caves far from the world of men, spending their days in prayer and fasting and leaving Carmel only to bring a message to the people from the Lord. How she loved to hear Samuel, how Samuel had begun the school to teach the children of Israel the mysteries and wisdoms of the ages. Now the stories were real to her, and she was the one who had come to learn. The temple stood at the crest of the mount, its blocks of white limestone were cut and fitted so precisely that it looked as if though the entire temple had been carved from one mass of rock. Two limestone wall courts encircled the temple, each with twelve arched gates representing the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve phases of man's sojourn on earth. The courts in the temple were rectangular in shape, with four gates on each side and three in the back overlooking the great sea. The main gate at the eastern end of the temple was double the size of the other gates, for this was the gate of Judah, and it was from the tribe of Judah that the Messiah would come. The temple itself was two stories high, with many arch windows that led in the light of the sun and the cooling breezes from the sea. Each arch was lined with sun faded red clay bricks, and their dusty rows softened the glaring of the shimmering white stone. A pathway of the same red brick, as wide as the gate of Judah, led from the complex of buildings on the cleared slope below through both courts to the base of the twelve wide steps rising to the second-story porch. Great carved cedar doors opened from the porch onto the holy recesses of the upper floor. The whole temple glowed with rosy warmth in the setting sun, and long shadows from branches bowing in the gentle breeze played upon its walls. It seemed alive, pulsating, beckoning, and Judith could barely restrain running through the inviting gates. The temple's hypnotic spell was broken as an old man with a tall, thin frame and a flowing white beard appeared, approached them with long, quick strides, and clasped Phineas in an crushing embrace. Peace be with you, he cried as he kissed Phineas on each cheek. Phineas returned the greeting, and as the old man turned to El Katma, his merry eyes softened and moistened. Ah, uh, El Katma, it's a long time since we've seen our beloved sister in God. El Katma held his bony hand and said, Too long, Enos, old friend, but to bring the child to visit Carmel would have only brought ridicule upon her from the other children in the village, and thus draw her thoughts away from God, and his purpose for her in this generation. We thought it best to keep her mind free from worry and worldly cares while she was yet so young. She will have enough of those when she is older, and pray God can bear them better. Enos nodded understandingly, and turned to Judith. Judith returned his scrutiny with a gaze as steady as his own. She guessed this was Enos, a priest and leader of the Essenes, and that his approval was imperative to her acceptance at the school on Mount Carmel. Welcome to Mount Carmel, Judith. We have looked forward to admitting you into our school for a long time. I saw you admiring our temple. Do you like it? Oh, yes, Judith breathed. It's beautiful. It seems to smile and beckon to me as though it's waited for me as long as I have longed and waited for it. Enos smiled and laid his hand upon her head and felt the heavy silken hair beneath it. She was tall for her age, standing level to his shoulder, and her piercing blue eyes had a depth and maturity unusual in a child so young. She had a woman's face and voice, thought Enos. 
Though she is only eight years old, she makes me feel as though she knows everything, has felt everything, and has experienced everything. And so, perhaps she has. Enos cupped her chin in his hand and studied her face. Her skin was brown and moist, her mouth wide and full and set with purpose, her jaw square and firm. She was not a child, which one could mold and bend at will, but a child of iron who would use her will and healthy body for a singleness of purpose. Nothing would deter her once she found that purpose, and it was now in his hands to guide this child to make that purpose one with God's. Tomorrow I will take you to the temple and teach you myself of what it means, but for now, come. The sun is setting, and it will soon be time for the evening meal. Do you wish to go to your lodging for the students, or would you rather stay with your mother and father? Enos turned to Phineas. A tent has been prepared for you in El Katma, and we wish for you to stay as long as possible. Not many of the Brotherhood can come to Carmel in these troubled times, and we are overjoyed that you are here. Judith fought a battle between wanting to start a new life at once and wanting to stay with her parents, whom she knew were suffering over leaving their only child. Her love for El Katma won out, and she said, I'll go with my mother to the tent. El Katma shook her head. She spoke quickly, though her voice caught. You'll go to the lodgment. You are no longer just a young girl. Today you are a handmaid of the Lord. We shall see you every day that we are here, but you must fulfill the promise given by the angel. Enos was pleased to see the child put her parents' wishes before her own. She had been taught well. He thought she is kind and perceives the pain of others and shows strength to endure disappointments. They walked along the red brick wall toward the compound below. The walk was lined with rows of flowers, and the lawns were green and finely manicured. Flowering shrubs had been planted between the walk and the court walls, and the air was profuse with their perfume. Judith looked through each gate as they passed, awed by the simple beauty inside the courts. Fountains bubbled and splashed with cool, clear water, and beds of flowers had been planted and carefully tended throughout the court. Here and there, trees had been left standing and wooden benches, benches encircled their trunks. There were also benches honed from stone, and a few were occupied by white-robed monks or scribes studying small scrobes and writing on wax tablets. She caught a glimpse of a group of girls little older than herself, putting their needlework into their linen sewing bags, their lessons finished for the day. Judith grimaced and fervently hoped she would not have to learn how to sew. How wonderful it would be to read and study in this peaceful place. If only she could have been a boy, she could have been become a monk. But she was a girl, and they would want her to cook and sew and learn all the other arts of homemaking. The prospect was abhorrent to her. She lifted her chin defiantly and thought she would not, could not, for she had no inclination towards keeping house or cooking meals. She wanted to study. Judith sighed. There are so many things to learn, and she wanted to know them all. She couldn't be bothered with mundane things like sewing. It took too much time, and even if she studied all her life, she still wouldn't know all the things she learned to know, longed to know. They met a young monk with curly black hair and a short beard who stepped aside to let them pass, bowing gravely at Enos as he did so. His smooth cheeks above his beard flushed when his eyes met Judith, but when he realized she was only a child, he smiled delightfully. Judith returned his smile instantly liking him, and after he had passed, he asked Enos who he was. That is Joseph ben Jacob of Nazareth, Enos answered. He is a student at the City of Salt before the earthquake. He returned home when the brothers were forced to leave the destruction, and when he reached the age of manhood, he came here to Mark, Mount Carmel and joined the Brotherhood as a, mark, as a monk. He is a most gifted carpenter, even surpassing his father, who is regarded as the best in Galilee. You admire the great temple doors, Judith? They were carved by Joseph. Judith was impressed. She turned and watched the young man walking hurriedly away. His white robe swirled at his ankles and his long, waving black hair bounced against his shoulders. She hoped he would, she would see him again. Enos was saying, We believe each soul has its own particular gift to give in service to God and men. Unfortunately, too many use their gifts to satisfy self and for the aggrandizement of the body, much to the loss to their souls. Joseph is doubly gifted. 
for not only is he an artist in wood, but he is also blessed with the most humble and gentle of natures, and is dearly beloved by everyone, and most of all, I think, by God. Judas was dismayed at the jealousy she felt. She had no particular talents, and she was far from being humble and gentle. She was stubborn and strong-willed, and was known to argue vehemently to get her own way. As though she could read her thoughts, Enos went on to say, Ah, if all the souls upon the earth were as Joseph, but they are not, and so we have great need of people of a stronger mean to teach and admonish and stem the growing tide of the sons of darkness. A strong will and eloquent tongue can be an excellent force for good, if tempered with piety and charity and love for one's fellow man. Judith felt better and smiled at Enos gratefully. As they neared the farthest great gate, the girls Judith had seen inside the court came out, led by a young woman about twenty years of age. She was tall and big-boned, with a large, open, friendly face. Enos introduced her to Phineas and Elkatma, then returned to Judith. And this is their daughter, Judith, who will be a student in our school. I'm just bringing her to the House of Lodgement, but since the hour is late, perhaps she could go with you and get acquainted on the way? The woman's name was Eloise. Judith stared at her and thought she looked like one enormous block. Her large square face was framed with thick chestnut hair flowing over strong square shoulders, and she grasped, grasped Judith's shoulders with big square hands and studied her with merry eyes, a smile playing upon her generous mouth. Judith, she cried, what a lovely name and so tall. She turned to the other girls. Here is competition for your games. I bet Judith will outrace you all with those long legs. The girls laughed and crowded around her. Maybe she could even be Nathan, one girl sighed dreamily. They all broke into gales of easy laughter, laughter with Eloise laughing loudest of all. Come, Judith, Eloise chortled. We'll explain this mysterious Nathan along the way. Judith was bewildered and confused. She had never been a part of a group her own age and didn't know exactly how to act. In Cana, she was considered strange and the other girls had kept their distance. These girls were welcoming her without reservation and with no suspicion in their eyes. Their teasing was merry and kind, and their faces an open invitation to be one of those. She suddenly felt shy and tongue-tied. She looked to her father for support, and Phineas smiled and nodded to her. Go. One of the girls grabbed her hand, and she found herself being pulled along as one of the group. El Katma watched her leave. She's never had a friend, she said sadly. Enos touched El Katma's shoulder sympathetically. Here she will have many, for our children know that God is no respecter of persons, that a soul is unique and fills a place which only that particular soul can fill. They also know the circumstances of Judith's birth, and being older than she will help her in every way they can. He left Phineas and El Katma at their tents and invited them to eat their evening meals as guests in the dining hall for the priests and monks in the temple. They entered the courts through the northwestern gate of Naphtali sorry, and stood uncertainly at the door until smiling white monk robes gestured the, or, yeah, white monk robes gestured for them to follow and led them to the far end of the room to a table directly in front of the raised dias on the, of the priest's table. Phineas and El Katma flushed, embarrassed at being so honored. The room was long, stretching the entire width of the temple. The walls were plastered white, with niches cut into the stone, which held small, polished, brass oil lamps. The table which Phineas and El Katma sat was parallel to the priest table, but the others were laid out in the opposite way. They were low, finely made of pine, cedar, and, of e and the evening sun reflected on the burnished wood with a warm, inviting glow. Carefully dyed rush mats, where they sat, aided, or excuse me, added a cheerful note to the otherwise white room. A lectern stood on the raised stone dais before the door to the passage which led through the rest of the main floor. It was made of lemon wood and delicately carved with the cherubim whose uplifted faces looked adoringly at the wooden cross, crowned by a golden sunburst. Phineas wondered if it, too, was the work of the gifted Joseph. The monks were filing in. 
silently taking their assigned places according to rank. The higher ranking sat nearest to the ta priest table, and so on down to the lowest. They all were dressed uniformly in flowing white robes. Phineas was astonished to see the long, aquiline face of an Egyptian, the smooth yellow skin and hooded eyes of an Hindu, and across the room a black, compassionate face from the depths of darkest Africa. Why, these men are from all over the world, thought Phineas. Why would such men of these ever come to Mount Carmel? Enos and the two other priests who Phineas recognized as Judas and Matthias took their places. And as though on cue, the younger members of the Brotherhood, who had not yet earned the privilege to eat with the others, filed in carrying earthenware wine vessels and huge trays laden with loaves of white bread. They served the wine and bread, beginning with the priests, and then going to Phineas and El Katma, and on the ranks of the monks. No one spoke, for it was the rule that silence be kept throughout the meal, and after that it be broken only according to rank and with permission of the others. When all had been served, Eno stood and spread his hands above the cup and intoned the blessing. He raised the cup with outstretched arms as an offering to the Lord. He drank and then broke the bread, following the ritual of the wine, his deep, rich voice blending with the evening songs of birds and the soughing of the pines. The young monks returned with the kettles of steaming stew, which they laid in plain pottery bowls placed before each, again beginning with the priests. After the stew came the trays of grapes, apples, and melons, and plates of cheeses and ripes, or bowls of ripe, salty olives. The fare was simple, but the stew was thick and del delicately seasoned. The fruit was fresh and chilled, and the cheese sharp and aged exactly right. Phineas and El Katma ate with relish as the senior monk stood at the lectern and read the word of the Lord from a huge scroll. When the meal was finished, Enos asked Phineas to walk with him. They strolled through the courtyards and out of the gate of Ephraim, where El Katma pled weariness and retired to the tent. The night was warm and clear, and the first stars began to weaken the wink in the velvet sky. The scent of the laurel and jasmine and earth drifted in the still night air, and carrying with it the poignant song of the nightingale. It was a tranquil night, soft and surprisingly cool after the heat of the day. They walked across the verdant lawn and through the trees which hid the temple from the sea until they reached the rocky bluff that jutted out over the dark water below. They stood for a while in the companionable silence, drinking in the cool night air and basking in the contentment of another, another one's company. When Eno spoke, his voice was musing and gentle. He didn't look at Phineas, but stared out across the black expanse of the sea, as though he saw a vision of the words he spoke somewhere out on its farthest shores. Part 2 of Chapter 2, soon.